So Gina comes to us today with experience as five years as a newspaper reporter and photojournalist, nine years as managing editor of Engage Magazine, four years as communication strategist for the Church of the Nazarene with uh, constituents in 36 countries. And now she is a collaborative storyteller, passionate about accuracy, excellence, and emotional memorable narratives. And so we want to just give her the time today to really share from her heart and from her experience. And she's got a lot of uh, wealth of information to, to engage us with today. So um, welcome, welcome Gina. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Well, it's really good to be here with all of you and I appreciate you taking the time. I feel honored um, to be with you and, and that you're taking the time this morning. I always like when we do any kind of presentation or webinar to jump straight into a story to get us started since we're talking about stories. Um, so this opening story is um, from a, a, a women's devotional that I was asked to write and I was given a very short amount of words. Um, so I'll just, you can read along and, and I'll read it out loud as well. Um, I got home late from work. So I was late starting dinner for our guests and worse, our guests came early. So the dishes were still dirty in the sink and the food wasn't ready. And I was just really embarrassed and ashamed. Um, the ladies volunteered, we'll wash the dishes for you. And soon we were laughing, joking, and we were talking while we were working together in the kitchen. And rather than guests, they suddenly felt like family. Um, so just like in this very short story, um, and let's see if I can advance, yeah. Um, so just like in this very short story, nearly all stories include five elements, um, and that's one of the sections we're going to talk about today. And, um, and then at the same time, uh, emotionally connecting stories it include two kinds of conflict, and so we're going to talk about that as well. We are going to explore a little bit of how we can use our five senses to create the setting for the story and to help readers come through their imagination. And if we have some time, we're going to talk a little bit about dialogue and what dialogue looks like and how to use it in a story. So that's what I'm going to go over and I'm going to try to keep track of the clock and I may skip some things if, if we're taking a while, but I want to invite you, um, if you guys have a question along the way and you want to stop me, please feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me. It's completely okay because I want to make sure everyone's tracking and we you know, answer any questions along the way. Um, so first I'm going to start with the five elements of a story. And we can use narrative story in almost any type of writing. So the earlier example I gave you was actually from a devotional. I only shared the story part of the devotional, but then it went on to talk about, um, you know, a, 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 a biblical principle um, based on that story. We might think that of stories only as novels or movies. But I always told stories in my missionary presentations when I visited churches. Um, when we share our Christian testimony with someone, we're telling a story. Um, and when I was a newspaper journalist, I often took my newspaper articles and I told a story through them because that's the best way that humans, um, that God has designed us to actually receive information and process information. Um, so the five elements of the story, every story has characters, one or more characters. Every story has a setting. Every story has a conflict or some kind of problem, and we'll explore that more. Every story has a plot, and every story has some kind of resolution to the conflict, uh, to the problem. So um, we're going to go into more detail on these five elements of a story. So first of all, and again, stop me at any point if you have a question. Um, Every story has characters. So the characters are the people in the story. Um, often there's one or several main characters and that's really around the, the, the story develops around those that person or those people. Then there can be other supporting characters that are involved, but they're less central to the story. Um, so one way to sort of know who the main character is typically is as 
the listener or the reader, it's the main person you're paying attention to or who you feel something for them. And a character doesn't even have to be human. A character can be spiritual. It can be God, um, you know, Jesus. It can be um, even an animal um, or something else, but we'll focus mainly on people. And I just had a quick question to sort of pull you guys in. Can you think of a story that um, is a favorite story where you have a favorite character that has stayed with you um, even after you finished reading the story or watching the film or something like that? <laughs> in the Bible, maybe, do you have a favorite character, somebody that has really stayed with you? Yeah, it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I like Daniel. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. For me, um, my devotion these days from uh, Exodus, so the story of Moses really like uh, stuck in my mind. Mm. I'm reading that too, yeah. What, what about Moses sticks out in your mind? How, how he, lead, he leads the, the Israelis, Israelites to, from Egypt to the Canaan. Mm -hmm. I mean, during the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So the burden of leadership maybe is something that speaks to you. Yeah. 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 Phyllis, did you start to give one example? Well, I was going to say that I like Daniel, but um, if we go with what we've been reading about, then it's Easter time. I've been reading mm -hmm. about Jesus, and he's truly impressive. Mm -hmm. He's experienced everything possible, and that's become, and that's impressive. I like that. But with Daniel, it's just that he's courageous. Mm -hmm. The courage, especially in times like these, um, that can be really inspiring. Uh, I'm going to keep us moving. So I'm going to take us into setting um, the second element of a story. Um, I think it's probably the least important, but it is important. So occasionally you might find a short story, especially like in the Church of the Nazarene, when we're telling quick, we're quickly trying to get stories out. But the setting is the location where the story takes place. Um, it can also be when the story takes place. So the setting, um, it can be geographic. So a story might take place in say, like Nairobi, Kenya could be the setting. Um, the setting could be inside someone's house or in their workplace or at school. The setting could be the year 2018. It could be, um, you know, a setting in the Bible that's 2,000 years ago. And um, so you want to think about like time, dates, places. And one thing to really keep in mind if you guys are writing stories from your own life or from your myth is it's easy to forget that our readers may not be familiar with the setting that we're writing from, mm -hmm. especially if it's an international audience. So it's really helpful to give people a sense of the climate. Um, you know, what's the weather like that day? Or what does the landscape look like? What kind of plants or what kind of animals um, are the characters seeing and experiencing? Mm -hmm. And so we can use our five senses um, to help build that setting for the reader. So we can incorporate things that the characters are seeing, things they're hearing, um, things they're tasting, if they're, you know, eating something, um, things they're smelling around them, and things that they can feel and touch. Um, is there a setting that you can think of from a story that you've read that really took you to a place you've never been before? Um, does anybody want to talk about that? Again, as I told you before, that my devotion is from Exodus. So, uh, for example, when when God spoke to the Israelites in the Sinai, and the they they were in the not uh, not on the mountain, but I can I can imagine how Moses there, how the Israelites there. Yeah. You can imagine like the, 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 the desert, maybe the heat and the, yeah. 
the dust that yeah. gets in your mouth. Um, yeah, the sun very hot. <laughs> yes, yeah, the sweat and everything. That's a great example because the Exodus story the is critically important. Mm-hmm. The fact that they're in a desert and they have no way to provide for themselves, that they are completely dependent on God. Um, you know, the snakes that they encounter and they, they cry for water because there's no mm-hmm. water. Um, there's no meat, you know, all of that setting is why the story unfolded the way it did. So that, that's a really good example. The next element of the story is the conflict or the problem. So, um, this can be a little confusing because the word conflict sometimes means two people maybe fighting or, um, a problem we can think of as something really negative. Um, but I kind of describe a problem as the struggle. So what is the character struggling to work through? Um, and the, so this struggle, this conflict or problem is anything that carries the series of events of the plot forward. Um, I'm going to mm. move this so I can actually see my, uh, my PowerPoint. And there is no story without a conflict. There's no plot without a conflict. So you got to have some kind of conflict in the story. Um, the problem can actually be positive or negative. The problem can't, so, so an example of a positive problem might be, um, you know, someone has found out that they've been accepted to university, which is great, but now they have to figure out how to pay for it. Um, they might be having hesitations about leaving their family and moving mm-hmm. to another city. Um, they might not be sure that they are academically capable of studying at the university level. So that might be one example. One time in Engage Magazine, we wrote a story about a young man who fell in love with a young woman and he didn't know how to tell her or how to tell her pastor father. So that is like a, another example of a positive problem. Um, and again, the problem can be like when I say internal that is something going on inside a person, in their emotions, in their spirit, in their like mind, um, or it can be something external, which means outside of the person. Um, so an example of maybe an outward or external conflict would be somebody loses their job, um, or it could be that their car won't start and they need to get to work. Um, an, ex- an internal problem would be that feeling of the man falling in love with the woman but not knowing, how, how, trying to get the courage to talk to her father, or even to talk to her. It might be someone dealing with depression or, um, you know, wrestling with accepting Christ as their savior, you know, something going on inside. Um, so they'll, they'll, we'll talk more about that in a little while. So the plot is the fourth element of the story. This is the series of actions or events that are unfolding from beginning to end and they help the character take their problem and come to a resolution. So one way I think about a plot is the plot is repeatedly answering the question, well, what happened next? And then what they, what did they do? Um, and then what did they do after that? And then what happened? So the plot is repeatedly answering that question. The plot also might answer the question, well, because this happened, then this. So because and now, so cause and effect. And then the resolution is the fifth element of the story. And so when we talk about a resolution, we're talking about either a solution to the problem or just a conclusion, like an ending to the story, to the series of events. And some people feel like that uh, the conclusion to the conflict means that it comes to a perfect or a happy ending. And that's not necessarily true. It only means that the, the series of events in the problem and the plot have come to some kind of natural end. So in some way, it's satisfying to the person receiving the story, whether they're listening to the story or they are reading the story. So if you don't have these five elements of a story, it's really, it's not a story. Basically, you've, these are the five characteristics that make a story. Um, So I thought we could look at a couple stories and talk about, like, try to identify those five elements in practice. 
So this is another story that was, again, one of those very short devotionals that, um, or actually this is the same one. <laughs> this is the same one from earlier. So if you remember, I was um, having people come over for dinner, but I got home late and then they arrived early and I wasn't ready. Um, so I would love to hear from you guys as you pick out the five elements of the story, the characters, the setting, mm. the problem, the plot, and the conclusion. Mm. Does anybody want to, do you want to teamwork? One person grabs one, one person grabs another, or does one person want to try to grab all five? Yeah, let's share it. Yeah, let's take one at a time and just just try to jump in. Um, I'll try to be the last person to speak. <laughs> so who are, who are the characters? Me and the ladies. Yep. And then what's the setting? Our house. Yep, my house, my kitchen. Yeah. And what is the problem? She got home late <laughs> from work. Yeah, that is the, the problem is the thing that sets off the whole conflict. So getting home from late, start, getting home from work late started the whole problem. Uh, what, what other kind of problems are going on here? She had gas. Mm -hmm. And the gas came ugly. <laughs> they, they had, she had dirty dishes and she wasn't ready for guests. The house, the kitchen was not clean. So mm -hmm. she was not ready for guests. Yeah. And that's the external problem, right? That's happening around the character. So being late. Um, having a dirty kitchen, people coming over. What's the internal problem that the character is experiencing? She felt embarrassed and ashamed. Mm -hmm. yep. Very, you know, stressed, rushed, and then embarrassed and ashamed. So, so there's two problems going on here. There's the external problem of the person just not being ready for the guests to come. And the internal problem is how she feels about it. Um, and then what is the, um, like, if you could sort of see a quick plot happen, if you could answer the question, well, what happened, then what happened next, and then what happened next, how would you describe that? If you were to like came late to someone else, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, so she came thing, late. Yeah, first thing she came her, home. Yeah, she came home late. Her guests already there. Right. Uh, but everything uh, in a messy. But then uh, her guests help her. And it end with the like happy ending because they had a good conversation, good mm -hmm. talking. Yeah, and they came closer together as, as almost like family, whereas they might have started feeling not like they knew each other very well or something like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I wanted to show you another story that we could talk about and it looks like a lot of text. I'm sorry about that. Um, I took a story that we published, I think it was in Eurasia, the Eurasia Nazarene News. Um, and, and so um, I'll just, I'll, I'll skim this story quickly. It's about a girl named Kaushila. Kash, uh, Kaushila was a small girl. Um, since she was a small girl, she suffered from constant headaches and they made her sick and they caused her to miss a lot of school. Uh, she was a student in grade eight, grade eight public school near her village in South Asia, and she's the only daughter of a big family of seven members. She lives in a small farming village that sits just below the cold, misty hills that mark the beginning of wide, hot plains, 
And Kashila was born to spend her childhood in a green sea of tea trees and rice fields that produces many things for the rapidly growing town nearby. Her family believes in worshiping nature spirits and her poor parents spent a lot of money on offerings and sacrifices at different temples and holy places trying to cure her headaches. Every Saturday morning, she, uh, I gotta move my video here. Um, let's see. Every Saturday morning, she walked two kilometers up a dusty road to the jungle and she splashed herself with the icy waters of a holy bath, hoping it would cure her. She said, I did all those things because the fortune teller said I would die if I failed to go to the jungle and take this holy bath under the peepal tree. Yet she was not cured and her parents were very worried about their daughter's future. Then NCM, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, started a child development center in her village and she was enrolled. And from her teachers, she heard about Jesus healing sick people and raising the dead. And she learned to pray to Jesus about her problems. Slowly and gradually, her headaches lessened. She stopped going to the holy bath and making sacrifices to the gods. Instead, she goes to the church and she takes part in Sunday school activities. Earlier, she was often disturbed by headaches when she studied. She used to be scared of getting sick during an important exam, but now she has complete trust in Jesus that he can protect her from any danger. She said, the way the fortune teller guided me wasn't working. Now I know that I was walking in the wrong way and now I'm not scared. So I thought maybe really quickly again, um, we could look at this story and if you all would be willing to talk about the characters, the setting, the plot, uh, the problem and the resolution as you understood it. Do you guys wanna jump in? Who are some of the characters you met here? Besides, we already know Kaushwila, so let's put her aside. What, who other did you hear about even a little bit? Her family. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the fortune teller. Mm -hmm. NCM. Mm -hmm. Jesus. That's right. Yeah. And what did, what did you notice about the setting? Could you picture any parts of it as you heard or looked at the story on the screen? I imagine a like rural place somewhere maybe in India or yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you see anything? Could you picture something in your mind or, or, or maybe smell or feel something? I can imagine the forest and also uh, when she went to, the, to, to take the bath, that's very cold. <laughs> right. <laughs> if, if I could add to, I think I see too that the picture of the, t the temples and the um, rice fields and the um, like taking money uh, just that idea that they're always going to the temple to give offerings and so I wonder this concept of nature spirits is that more a part of the setting or is that more a part of the character that's interesting because it seems like it's could be both but yeah it's I guess it would depend on how much more the story were developed and what the writer would do with that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really like the description of the setting. I actually, the story was sent to me from someone at NCM. And since I, um, you know, don't live in that area, it's really different landscape and different climate. So it helped me picture more of her life and where she lived. So I really like that. What is, the, what is the internal problem she's facing and what is the external problem? Um, she's suffering from headaches and that's make her sick. 
Yeah. What else? There's there's a lot of problems going on in this story. Yeah, they are poor and uh, they spend a lot of money. I could imagine that spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. She fears spirits. Mm -hmm. She's trying to go to school and deal with being sick all the time and, and uh, you know, trying to keep up with her studies. I see too, like her parents, her parents worry. I, I think that would impact her as well. Like she probably is trying to feel like she wants them to not be worried. Um, yeah. So it could be both external a little bit, but it could influence her as well. Mm -hmm. And when you said she feared the spirits, that's in some ways both an internal and an external because she lives in a society that has taught her that, they're, that that's, that's their religious worldview but then it brings her in internally a sense of fear or maybe not understanding. Another internal problem for her is, um, is just the fear of having one of these attacks when she has an important exam. Um, so there's a, you, you, you see the external, I, and I, I don't know whether the headaches would be an internal or external, but I think of it as external because it's not emotional. Um, it's like kind of coming at her from out of her control, but then her feelings about it would maybe be the internal problem. Um, does somebody want to summarize the plot um, the, the series of events really quickly at, that go from the problem to the conclusion. So Kashila um, was sick a lot and lived in fear and, uh, and in poverty and um, really struggled with her situation. Um, but then NCM came to her village and through school, then she got help and she didn't live that way anymore. And what spiritually would you say happened for her as the resolution? Learning to trust Jesus. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the resolution to the story? She goes to church and takes part in Sunday school activities, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the way she compares how she used to feel or how she used to think and now how she feels and thinks differently. Um, so like when she says she has complete trust in Jesus Christ, that he can protect her from any danger. I mean, that's a huge change from her constant fear and wondering if she's even gonna be able to take an exam. Um, so, so that shows that Jesus power, even though it's not telling it so much, it's showing that Jesus power is greater than the, than what she was fearing. Right. Sometimes, sometimes things aren't completely written out, but you can, you can guess those things. So if her family was in poverty and one of their problems is they're spending all their money to try to treat her and it's all failing, um, she gets enrolled in NCM. So that is, um, in a way bringing some financial relief because if she's sponsored, then the funds are coming from somewhere else. Um, so they have a little more extra money probably, but if they stop going to the holy bath and making all these sacrifices, that means again, they're a little more, they have a little more money in their pocket as a, you know, because they're not paying Jesus to treat her. Jesus offers that for free. Um, he gives it as a gift. So we, it doesn't have to be clearly written in the story, but we can guess certain things like that as well. And one thing I like about this story is it's not a perfect happy ending because she still gets headaches. 
what has changed is not necessarily her external, all of her external problems. What has changed is she has hope and peace um, in the midst of her problems. So I thought that was an interesting and kind of a, a nice um, resolution to that. Do you guys have any questions so far or anything you wanna talk about? Okay, I'll go ahead, but feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'll go through this a little quickly because we've already been talking about it, um, but I wanted to just really, um, again, um, explore the fact that a problem or a conflict must be part of the story or there's no story. So a lot of times as an editor, I've received what people call a story, but I would call it more of a report. Um, and I actually, I'm coaching an author right now, and he sent me a few chapters that I wouldn't call a story because um, there wasn't any problem. He was just going through a series of actions, but there was no problem to resolve. So um, again, it's very important that there's some, it doesn't have to be a big dramatic problem. It can be something very small, even something kind of funny or night or, or like positive, like we talked about earlier. But the problem is what helps the character struggle through the problem and, and grow in some way. The character is um, growing internally in some way. And so the and also the problem is this is usually presented at the very beginning of the story because the problem sets off a series of events that are what we call the plot. Um, and again, an external conflict is something that's happening outside of us. So it could be a physical problem like, um, like how Sheila's headaches or a situational problem. And then the internal problem is something that exists within us. So something spiritual, emotional, something going on in our minds. And usually the best stories have both. The best stories have both an external an outside problem and an internal problem. And um, what I think is interesting is sometimes the problem first starts outside of us. Um, so, you know, maybe losing a job or uh, a loved one gets sick or we can't get our car started. And then it creates an internal problem. So it creates the fear that we experience or the stress or the, the, the pride that we feel about something. But it can also go the other way. So sometimes the problem can start inside of us that creates all the external problems around us. So maybe someone's internal problem maybe is they're lazy and they should have done some things to get their car ready. And when they didn't do those things, now their car won't start. Um, or they weren't, uh, they weren't working hard at work or they had a, an arrogant attitude at work and so it caused them to lose their job. So it's interesting, sometimes it can start outside and sometimes it can start inside. Um, let's see. Um, again, this, I think I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, but I do wanna talk a little bit about our, when we, when we write about our setting, to really think about your five senses. So thinking about things you taste, smell, feel, hear, or see. And it doesn't mean you have to use all five senses. It just gives you things to, um, to use to create your setting. I think the most often what we tend to rely on is things you see because we're so, God made us so visual oriented. But don't forget um, to, to bring smells into your, your setting or to bring sounds. I, I love personally to use sounds like um, you hear traffic going by on the highway or you hear birds chirping or you hear the distant sound of kids, you know, screaming and laughing. And that really, I think, can, can definitely bring a, a reader in their imagination to the place that you're writing about. And someone sent in this uh, example of a description that I thought was so, you know, powerful. And I just want to share it with you so you can use your imagination and, and then remember, you know, later um, how to use the different senses. So in this description, uh, three boys get on an old beaten up yellow school bus. 
and the other children welcome them with cheerful greetings and high fives. The boys are wearing ripped jeans, faded t-shirts, and worn out shoes, and they begin chatting happily to their, to their friends and leaders about homework assignments and basketball games and siblings who bring stray cats home. An older boy lights a cigarette and the acidic smoke floats through the air and out the window where a sea of identical brick buildings and trash scattered in the grass and moldy used furniture is scattered on lawns and it all begins to fade from sight as the bus drives on. Just over two miles away from this crumbling neighborhood are the glittering lights of Nashville, Tennessee's world famous Broadway, where the sparkling jewels and the new leather cowboy boots and bright lights take center stage. So which senses were, were engaged for you in, in hearing or reading this description? What can you see, first of all? We'll start with the thing we do most uh, automatically. Sorry, there's a school bus. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? I can like? see the... Go ahead. Go ahead, Willis. I'm sorry, who? Um, Phyllis, just continue with your description of, of what you saw in your mind. Maybe not even what's what was written, but what you saw or what you, you know, heard. Um. Well, it's um, a simple, a simple atmosphere. There's not a lot of wealth, but it's a happy place and going home from school and leaving the city behind into a more rural area. Mm -hmm. Rural means village area. Mm -hmm. I like I like how you interpreted that as um, it's not maybe wealthy, but it's happy and simple. Which is a mo you're expressing a feeling that you got inside from just a basic description. Um, did anyone else have something really um, capture your imagination, uh, something you heard in your mind or something you smelled? Yeah. Um, anything like that? Yeah, I can see the... Go ahead. Oh. I can see the like the students, the boys, um, like their outfit and like their conversation. I can hear like their conversation and also like the smell of the cigarette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The smoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find it interesting how the um, like I saw the contrast at first was just how like the the describing how the clothes that the that the boys were wearing um at first you don't really think about like whoever whatever's whoever's on a school bus um would include a wide variety of of different of kids from different backgrounds um and then and then i so i start to imagine that maybe they're coming from like a a poorer area of this of the city um but i like the it just seemed like um, a visual, a really clear visual about the smoke, um, like blotting out the the scene from the from the city, um, and just well, even from the area, the area with all the poverty, that somehow all of those outward signs of poverty were were being. Um, hidden and mm -hmm. so that somehow the real value of the of the kids were actually not related to that so it, it just kind of gave me a it helped me see um a contrast mm -hmm. 
Cool. Uh, for me also, also it's interesting because in here in Indonesia, the students, uh, they wear like uniform. But in here, the, the boys, the students, they, they wear ripped jeans, t-shirts, sneakers, like that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that uh, it gives me like another perspective of uh, the culture, like that. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, yeah. And, and because you, if they didn't describe what the kids were wearing, you might have pictured uniforms because that's what you know students yeah. do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not, not every culture has, has transportation like a bus to carry the kids to school. Um, they might walk, you know, or, or take a, um, pay, pay for a ride um, or go with another family or something like that. So it reminds you because at the beginning of the story, it doesn't say where it is. It's only at the end, and, and technically this isn't a story, it's a description. It, go, it goes into a story later, I just didn't bring that part. But it's at the, ver the fourth paragraph before you know that they're in Nashville in the United States. But you knew they weren't in Indonesia, right? <laughs> because of the way it was described. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the very first also line. Yeah, this, the sign about yellow school bus, that, that told me that we had to be in the U.S. because I have not found a yellow school bus anywhere else in the world so far. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty iconic. Um, when I was uh, serving the church in, I think, Germany, one of my friends, um, she grew up watching American TV shows where the kids get on the yellow school bus and she always wanted to see one. It was like this dream. She wanted to see her, in real life a yellow school bus and when you see them and ride on them every day, that just surprised me so much, but it was, it was fun. Let's see. Um, okay, so one thing I wanted to show you from one of our writing trainings in Eurasia to, to help you think how to write a plot, because I, I, think, I think and a lot of writers think that writing a good plot is really hard. <laughs> You can take whole university classes on how to write a good plot. And actually just today, I was talking with some other writers and they were saying, I have so many great story ideas, but I, I write five or 10,000 words and then I don't know what the plot is anymore and I just throw it away. It's one of the hardest things. Um, and again, it doesn't, it's surprising that it's so difficult because I think when we tell stories to each other, we just do it naturally as we talk about what happened at work that day or uh, an experience that happened at a restaurant. But when you try to write a plot, suddenly you can't do it. Um, but again, a plot is the series of events or actions that go from beginning to end, basically. And it's the sequence of events that take the problem and bring it to some kind of ending, some kind of solution or some kind of satisfying ending. And um, one of our volunteers did um, a writing training in uh, India, and he had this worksheet, which now you see on your screen. And it's so simple. And he had the writers there use this worksheet when they first start taking their notes to, to develop the basic structure of their story. And after that, all the stories I was getting from our writers in India were so good. So I, I was, I said, please send me a copy of this worksheet. I want to use this, you know? So um, I hope you can see on the screen, he called it a story spine. And I think he means like um, in English, when we talk about the human body, the spine is the bones that start at the back of your neck and they go all the way down your back. And without that, we can't uh, stand up and move. It's like central part of the body. So, so if you were to fill out this worksheet to start developing your story plot, you would start with number one, you would start with once upon a time. And then you, so once upon a time, a character and you say something about them. Then second, you would say what their life was like. What was their normal life like? every day, blah, blah, blah. And then the third part, you would say until one day, and that's when you introduce the problem. 
until one day, um, Kashwila was missing school because of all of her headaches would be one example. And then you, you answer the question because of that, this, or you answer another way of saying it number four is what happened next was this. And you just keep doing that until you run out of things that happen next. So this worksheet has only three of those lines, four, five, and six, but you could go on, you know, 10, 20, a novel, you know, a long novel would probably have hundreds of those until finally, and now you have essentially the climax or the resolution to the ending to the problem until finally, and ever since then, now, now your character has an end to the problem and they have a new normal life. They're, they have a new normal that is different from their, their before normal, before the problem, before all the events happen that brought it to a conclusion. And you don't have to have kind of a moral to the story, but you could. And I, so I got this worksheet and I, I, I thought, let me take some stories that I already have and work backwards and see if this really works. So I took the Kaushila story and I, I put it side by side with this worksheet. So once upon a time, Kashwila was a small girl and she suffered from constant headaches. They made her sick and caused her to miss a lot of school. I thought, well, that does sound like it works. Every day as a student in grade eight in a public school in South Asia, she was the daughter of a family of seven. And then it talks about the setting, you know, where she lives. Until one day, Kashwila's family spent a lot of money. Oh, number two, sorry. It talks about every day, you know, her family believed in spirit. This is her, this is her old normal. Her old normal was that um, her family believed in spirits. They offered sacrifices at the temple. She took the holy bath, but she was never cured. And her family was worried about her. So number three, until one day, NCM started a child development center in her village and Kashwila became a student in this child development center. Because of that, um, from her teacher, she heard about Jesus healing sick people and raising the dead. Because of that, she learned to pray to Jesus about her problems. And because of that, slowly and gradually, Kashwila's headaches started to get better. Um, until finally she stopped going to the holy bath and making sacrifices to the gods and now instead she goes to church and ever since she used to be scared of getting sick during an exam but now she has complete trust in Jesus that he can protect her from anything and at the optional number nine is what Kashila says at the end of the story she says the moral of the story is the way the fortune teller guided me wasn't working and now I know I was, you know, I was walking in a, in, in a wrong way and I'm not scared anymore because I know Jesus, I know the truth. So I thought that was really cool um, to work backwards and see if this really works. And then I did it one more time. So I took another devotional and I hadn't shared this with you yet because um, I skipped a little bit to keep us moving. But um, I was asked to write a very, very short devotional, actually five. So I shared one of them with you. And this is the second one. So once upon a time, I was homesick. I was depressed and I was struggling in our new host culture because we had moved to a new country. Every day I was nearly in tears and I didn't want anyone to see me crying until one day I stayed home from church because I didn't want someone to see me cry. But I still had to do laundry and the laundry machines were behind the sanctuary at the church. <laughs> and the congregation was having a pot, was having a, a meal. Everyone brought food together. So I was doing laundry and all of a sudden the door opened and there's one of the women from the church and she saw me. And because of that, she said, oh, we missed you at church. And because of that, I explained, oh, thank you. I wasn't feeling well. And I felt embarrassed that I was caught doing laundry and not going to church. And because of that, she asked, oh no, what's wrong? And because of that, I had to admit, well, I miss my family and I'm really sad. Um, until finally the woman looked at me and she said, I'm so sorry. It's hard to be away from home. 
And she was also far from her home country. And she said, can we be your family? And ever since I thought that was the most beautiful, any beautiful thing anyone had said to me in a while. So that was a story I wrote for the devotional and I took it backwards to the story spine and it just works perfectly. So I think I could start with this worksheet and I'm going to send Lisa a copy of this, this worksheet so she can send it to all of you. Maybe if you guys wanna translate it to make it a little easier to work with. But um, I really like this because I think it really helps make plot plotting, writing a plot a lot um, simpler. Do you guys have any questions, um, anything? Uh Ask. I have a question. Yeah. How about the story with reverse chronology? For example, like I I tell about my life now, but then I like I remember my past. Mm -hmm. So changing it so it's not step one, step two, step three, but maybe step five and then going back. Yeah. Yes, I love that. I love it when uh, when writers do that because. It creates suspense. I think if you guys know suspense, it's um, when you give people uh, incomplete information that makes them want to know more. Um, I One of my favorite authors, the very first paragraph of every book she writes is the end. Oh. And what, so you already know the ending when you start the book, but you don't know how it got there. So you feel so much suspense, like how did it, how did it happen this way? And then she works backwards and starts to tell you the story to help connect you from the end all the way back to the end. But now you know the whole story and how it ended that way. So yes, I think you can be very creative with this, this spine and, and kind of mix things up. You can do that, yeah. Okay. So like not every plot of the story must be like uh, from this one and the next, next thing, next thing like that. Right. As long as it's not confusing. Okay. <laughs> Do you have to have a certain amount of um, maybe sharing your writing as you're going along with people and having them check, are they confused? Um, and you might have to rewrite um, and sort of fix some of those things. So it is, you, you can write it in, in uh, changing the sequence or changing the order, but you do have to just be careful um, that you do it in a clear way so that people are not uh, confused or wait, uh, you know, the time, are we in the present? Are we in the future? Are we in the past? You know, things like that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? I think it's neat to see how how to include the emotion. Um, I think sometimes when we're writing, especially if we think we're writing an article, it's easy to feel like we have to just keep it really objective and just tell the details or the facts. But when you shared like, and this might help you even later when you share something about dialogue, but somehow in the setting details or in the dialogue, it, it tends to seem to create a, an opportunity for the emotion to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps readers to, to identify. That's good. Any other questions or ideas or thoughts? I think the story spine is a really good pattern to begin with to develop skills. And um, I want to go back and actually check and see how some I've written fit into that because that it's really good. That's cool. I'm glad. Now that I have it, I want to play with it too. It was fun to take an existing. So one thing people do is they will tell, they will summarize what the characters are saying and that's not very interesting. So it's what they're saying out loud. So it's not what they're thinking. Um, and it's not a quote to the writer. It's what they're saying to each other. And it's an example of how you can show a story rather than tell about a story. Um, and I know Lisa talked to you guys, I think last one of the other times about showing versus telling. Um, 
So let's see. So I, I made up a, a quick little story where as the writer, I said, Jason was afraid to learn how to ride the new bike he got for his birthday. So his father, Mike, told him about the time when Mike was Jason's age and was also learning how to ride a bicycle. Mike explained that it was very different, difficult to learn to ride the bicycle, that he had trouble with his balance and he was afraid of falling over. And he told his son, Jason, that it took lots of commitment and his grandfather's help to eventually get the hang of it. So that's an example of the writer summarizing and not letting the characters tell their own story. So then I rewrote it. And um, so this is how it would sound if you made it with dialogue. Dad, I love the bike you got me for my birthday, but I don't think I want to learn to ride it today, six-year-old Jason told his father, Mike, as he stroked the shiny dark red handlebars. Why not, son? Mike asked, holding Jason's helmet. Mike's forehead was crinkled in confusion. I'm scared, Jason said in a low voice, keeping his face turned to the gray cement floor. Mike kneeled down next to his son so he could look the boy in his eyes. What are you scared of, Mike asked, and he set the helmet down on the cool cement. I'm afraid of falling and getting hurt, Jason admitted, finally turning to look at his father. Mike smiled in understanding. Let me tell you a story about when I learned to ride a bike, Mike said, and he patted the floor beside him. Jason sat down and crossed his legs, waiting to hear the story. Well, one summer I was climbing a tree, Mike said, getting comfortable on the floor next to his son. I fell out of the tree and I broke my arm and it hurt a lot. Jason's eyes grew large with surprise. Ouch, he said. Yeah, ouch, Mike agreed. So when I got my first bicycle, I was afraid of falling over and breaking my arm or my leg or something because I remembered how bad my broken arm felt and I didn't want to hurt that much again. So this is a good example, I hope anyway, of dialogue because not only, and an important thing and the reason why I went ahead and put this on the screen is it's not just the words that they're saying, it's also their body, how their body is moving, what their face looks like, are they standing, are they sitting, are they turned away? Um, you can really add a lot of your five senses as you share the dialogue. And I think, and I know we don't have time to discuss this, but the dialogue gives you a very clear idea of what their personalities are like, um, whether they're kind or whether they're rude or whether they're grumpy or tired. Um, so the dialogue actually carries a lot of the parts of the story and the emotions and everything much more than, than perhaps this, this you know, summary. Again, thanks for inviting me. I always love with other writers at whatever level. It's just, you know, yeah, yeah. God gave all of us on our hearts and it's nice to share that with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And we do have several here, even a couple of them in this group and a couple others that just asked me to make sure and record so they can listen to this later um, that are really learning uh, to write right now. So, so I'm sure. grateful for that. I'll send you copies of everything too. Um, so, so you can do whatever you want with it. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, um, I think I've got, I've got a way to connect with most of you, if not directly, at least through someone on your field. So, so uh, I will continue with that and share, um, share the insights that we have. So uh, we'll also be hearing from Gina later in the year. Um, so just kind of keep posted. That's, uh, we'll, we'll keep having a, every couple of months of uh, writing training. So thank you to each one that uh, came on today, tonight, today. And um, uh, Phyllis, would you close us with prayer? Sure, I'd love to. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn how we can glorify you with writing better than we have before. Lord, we give you our talent and our desire and ask you to use what we have and make us better at doing it. And may your kingdom grow through the written word. Thank you for Gina and for Lisa. We pray your blessing upon them this day and your work in each of the places we serve. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. All right. Any final questions or comments that anyone wants to share? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I uh, thank you for the training today. I think I will pull out. Uh, I think I now have 365 mama stories on my Facebook. <laughs> That's awesome. I think I think um I will pull those out this summer so I can write for mama, for mothers. Uh -huh. And thank you for the training today. I really learned a lot. Good. Great. Thank you. Okay. Renny, thank you also for all that you shared. You were really, um, it was great to, to have that input from you. Thank you so much. Actually, this is my first time joining this, this I workshop and I, I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Wow, awesome. Yeah, yeah. brave and bold. Very good. <laughs> yeah, and I find that we learn most when we use it. So I hope that none of us will just take this as, okay, another piece of information to remember, but actually start applying it right away. So those reports will change faces <laughs> or at least add. Okay, well, thank you everyone. And um, we'll just see you in another couple months. Okay, Great. good night, Bye. good day.